Gus Malzahn, secret genius? Possibly. Now, a lot of you have labeled him otherwise, but I want you to remember what you thought and said about Gus Malzahn in maybe the last couple of years, maybe the last decade, because Gus Malzahn, I think, is a role model. Gus Malzahn, as of today, probably should have courses taught about him, not necessarily by him, but about him at every major university in America. I want you to think about something. Because a lot of you have had coaching idols out there and they have let you down and they have led you astray and they've, they've ended up fired, but then they've ended up fading into the abyss. Not Gustav Malzahn. What a turn of events, by the way. So he takes the Central Florida job. He's the new head coach of Central Florida. Again, congratulations. But the best part here is uh, Malzahn fooled large portions of the college football world in the process. And I want to rewind sort of and take you back down some roads in storytelling mode that I've told you before. And I want to use that as sort of the backdrop. I mean, I want you to think, I'll get to the story in a second, but I want you to think at every turn about what this guy's career has consisted of and what I would say the general narrative at any given time around him was. So he got hired as the head coach at Auburn in 2013. And he comes in and he talks like this a lot. You know, he puts his hand over his mouth. He's really secretive. He's got all kind of these demonstrative actions that he does and, and, and movements on the sideline. And, you know, a lot of people just thought he was strange, thought he was odd and eccentric. And they thought he was a Mickey Mouse offense kind of guy. Dude wins the SEC, goes to the national championship in his first year, gets 13 seconds from winning it. And then, you know, time goes on at, 2013 and beyond the big talking point around him was well he's he's having to compete with Nick Saban and the rest of the country is trying to hire coaches that can compete with Saban some of them have worked under Saban others are just going to be the kryptonite to Nick Saban and they're getting hired and they're getting fired and the entire seems like the entire SEC and in ways the entire landscape of the sport has overturned with people trying to figure out how to beat Malzahn or uh, uh, Nick Saban Malzahn does it three times just like that Boom, 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 not in a row, but he had more wins over Saban than any other coach has had over Saban. And how did he do it? No one really knows. Uh, fortuitous bounces here and there, but you got to be in position to benefit from the fortuitous bounces. But folks, those aren't even the best parts. If I'm writing the story, the chapter I'm about to take you back down, that's the best chapter. Do you remember 2017? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. So 2017, Auburn comes in. They're highly ranked. They are highly ranked every year. And then, as I've told you several times before, they go down to LSU. I was on the road with them for that game. I was on the field for that game. I was covering both teams, really. And it was, it was crazy because they got a big lead, looked like it was going to be a blowout. Uh, I, as I told you, I made my way to the press box early, and I started to eat the halftime meal early. And then all of a sudden, LSU scores. They go in the locker room. They come back out. They score. They score. They end up winning the game. So Auburn blows a big lead, and I am standing in the post-game press room for Auburn. Malzahn has not yet entered the room. Christy Malzahn, his wife, has. She is well within earshot, and various members of the Auburn beat are very vocal in their insistence that Gus Malzahn's job is done. It's not a matter of when anymore. It's just a matter of if. She can hear it. She didn't say a word. I have credited her before. I'll credit her again on this very program right now. Uh, Christy Malzahn did not say a word. And so as the story goes, you get a little bit later in the year, the team didn't quit. In fact, I think they played Arkansas like the next week and they got right back up off the map. And so they start to build some confidence. They start to build a little momentum. And then all of a sudden, it's later in the year. Here comes number one Georgia in town. I was there for that game. Smoked them. A couple of weeks later, Alabama comes in town. I'm there for that game. I get to cover all these games. That's the beauty of working in Columbus, Georgia. You get to reasonably tell your news director, I got to be there. Get me credentials. I got to be there. Well, they smoked Alabama too. And here is where it really gets interesting. Keep in mind, this guy was fired and out the door a month ago. Not only has he saved his job, but he has maximized his leverage and he knows it and his representation knows it. And they haven't forgot the tenor from a month earlier when no one had their back. And by they, I mean Malzahn and, and his representation, no one had their back and everyone was trying to push him out the door. And he, he comes back from dead. He's like the undertaker circa 1996. He, he rises from the dead, beats Georgia number one, beats Alabama number one, wins the SEC West, and it's time to go to Atlanta for the SEC championship game, right? Not yet. That week, Malzahn and his representation behind the scenes backed Auburn into a corner. They say, we want a new deal. We want it agreed upon before Saturday or he's going. 
What was the backdrop? You remember this? Well, there was allegedly, never will know if it was reality or not, but it was allegedly a big time offer on the table from Arkansas to bring Gus Malzahn home. That was the leverage play number one. Leverage play number two was, you know, the recent results on the field, and we're going to the SEC title game, reward this man. Leverage play number three that is often forgotten was there was a mess unfolding at Tennessee. There was a coaching search that had gone totally haywire. And so you were able to look Auburn in the eye, and you were able to say, the guy just saved your season, resurrected the entire program in many ways in the process. There is a big time offer elsewhere. He'd love to go home, you know, whether you call my bluff or not, he'd love to go home. And number three, do you really want to go through a coaching search and risk looking like what Tennessee looks like right now? Auburn folded like an accordion. They had no other option. They give him seven years, $49 million. That was the headline. But there was a fine print section in that contract that not many people talked about. There was this word. It started with an M. No one was really talking about it. The word that started with an M that everyone was focused on with Malzahn, there's one M word, was money. And he got a lot of it. But there was another word, kids, and it was mitigation. And to be direct, there was no mitigation clause in Gus Malzahn's Auburn contract. What does that mean? It means if he's out the door and he's fired, they owe him every bit of his buyout, even if he takes another job. Now, with that in mind, Gus Malzahn's the new head coach at UCF. And Gus Malzahn signs, what do we have here? We have a five-year, $2.3 million per year deal. That's nice. That's good money. You and I could probably survive on that, right? But he also gets $21.5 million guaranteed from Auburn in the process. And so for all of you out there, I'm standing over here. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not associating with that crowd. But for all of you who uh, criticized Malzahn in the past, made fun of him, called him this, called him that, I just want to ask, where are you going tomorrow? What do you got to be up at 7 a.m. to go do? Because Malzahn, man, he could... Um, Man, he could buy us all 10 times over and he gets to wake up in sunny Florida. I am in the middle of an ice storm right now. He's going to be in sunny Florida, probably sunburned already. He gets to play and coach rather and um, be in the mix at a program now that relative to his competition is at or above every important level, recruiting, budget, scheduling, uh, uh, geographically. He's got all the edges now that he never had at Auburn, and he's got a massive bank account to thank for all the moves that he made. And this is one of the reasons why Gus Malzahn, I really think, is a secret legend now in college football, especially when you're talking about the economics of college football. It begins and ends with Gus Malzahn. Now, from an athletic director and department standpoint, Hopefully we're seeing the final chapters on these mitigation disasters because, I mean, Will Muschamp walks away from Carolina. They owe him every bit of his money, even if he takes a job at Georgia. Malzahn walks away, well, not walking away, they get fired, but then they're taking these other jobs and you're realizing, wait, we got fleeced. Number one, we extended these coaches and gave them uh, probably above market value. That's debatable. But number two, no mitigation clauses in the contracts. How did that happen? It happens because... It is checkers versus chess. It is folks in these athletic departments dealing with world-class agents, and it's no contest in many ways. So Gus Malzahn, he's a winner.